All right, uh, thanks for that great introduction, Gregor. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Milan Kulkarni uh, from uh, Purdue University. Uh, you will note that I am not the first author on this talk. The work for this uh, for this project was done by my fantastic students, Leith and Krish. Unfortunately, they both have visa issues, and so you're stuck with me giving this talk instead. Um, so, as uh, Gregor pointed out, trees are everywhere. Tree traversals are everywhere in applications that we use every day and maybe some applications you're less familiar with. For example, uh, the web browser that you might be looking at right now, instead of listening to me, uh, uses a lot of tree traversals uh, when you're traversing the document object model in order to uh, render a web page. Uh, the compiler that maybe you should be using instead of talking to me to work on your research uh, does a lot of tree traversals as it does various optimizations and consistency checks, et cetera, on abstracts and text trees. Um, something you might be less familiar with is in the scientific computing context, there are a lot of applications that are structured around many traversals of trees. For example, uh, the Madness numerical simulation code or uh, classic n-body uh, algorithms like fast multiple method or Barnes Hutt. Um, now, one issue with writing traversals over trees is that they're a really convenient way of expressing the computation that you want to do. They, uh, they're, they're pretty easy to write. Uh, the structures themselves sort of match very nicely with the structure of your data and things like this. Unfortunately, as these trees get larger and larger, uh, tree traversals often suffer from very poor locality because you're traversing the same data over and over again, uh, but in an order that is very poorly uh, matched to the way caches behave. So let me just quickly show you an example of this. So this is a very simple tree traversal of a binary tree. Two traversals, I'm going to call them T1 and T2. They're each just doing some pre-order traversal of a binary tree with two different work functions. And the way that you might normally do this is you execute them one after another. And so traversal one executes work one by traversing the entire tree uh, in pre-order. And then traversal two follows up by executing work two over the entire tree in pre-order. So they're both touching the tree. Uh, to the, the overall tree. Both of them touch the full tree. Unfortunately, the order in which they do it gives you very poor locality because traversal two comes back and touches the root of the tree after traversal one has touched the rest of the tree and kicked the root out of cache. So, as Gregor pointed out, uh, the way that people fix this problem is you don't write this as two tree traversals. You write this as a single tree traversal, uh, which we're going to call T12 because it's doing both one and two, and it does both pieces of work, but now it does that work in a better order. It produces a better schedule where the same uh, traversal is doing both pieces of work, and I get to do all of the work on the root node at the same time, and then all of the work on the next uh, node, and so on and so on. Right? So I bring accesses for the same part of the tree closer together, I get better locality. This is great, except that it's not always clear when it's valid to do this. It's not always clear when it's legal to actually merge together multiple tree traversals to have them work at the same time. So in particular, uh, here's an example that's basically exactly the same as the first example, except uh, work one is now doing something real. Uh, it's incrementing a field uh, at every node of the tree. And work two is using the result of traversal one. So it's using the x field and using that to update field y. Uh, and if you do the, the uh, fusion here, everything works out. Everything is, is hunky-dory. Uh, everything works. The update to y correctly sees the updated value of x. But if I had instead written this tree traversal, not as two pre-order tree traversals, but one of them was post-order. If traversal one was a post-order uh, walk of the tree instead of a pre-order walk of the tree, when I try to fuse these two traversals together, it doesn't work anymore. Anyway. Uh, what's happening is that I'm going to try to access n.y, or I'm going to try to update n.y with the old value of n.x. The work from traversal 1 hasn't happened yet, uh, and so I get the wrong answer. Now, this seems like a pretty contrived example, and I agree that it is. We need it to fit on a single slide. Uh, and this is an example where you might be able to look at this and say, OK, obviously this doesn't work. In fact, I have some pretty good ideas about how I might fix this problem so that I can fuse these two traversals together. Uh, but and uh, we wrote a little simple uh, compiler that does a bunch of AST passes, not a terribly complicated thing. Here's the dependent structure uh, that you get from one of those passes. Lots and lots of statements that all depend on one another, uh, making sure that you can take something with this dependent structure and fuse it with five or six other passes that also have similarly complicated dependencies. That's obviously not quite so easy. So tree traversals are very common, uh, and as you might expect, uh, lots of people have looked at how to optimize sequences of tree traversals. Uh, for example, uh, there are people that have looked at using various kinds of abstractions to write tree traversals. For example, attribute grammars uh, that can be scheduled effectively and fused effectively, uh, or tree transducers, or special frameworks for writing traversals in the first place, uh, and they use various composition rules to fuse traversals together. Uh, more recently, uh, some people have actually looked at doing compiler analysis, analyzing the behavior of imperative tree traversals, which is what we look at in this work, uh, and figuring out what the dependencies are, 
dependencies are and how you might be able to fuse things together. Unfortunately, uh, all of these uh, approaches, at least uh, uh, to, uh, for the kinds of things that we want to do, don't look at general enough tree traversals. The dependent structures that they can handle, the kinds of traversals you can express, are a little bit limited. And so it means that you either have to sort of uh, twist and contrive yourself to write your traversals in a correct way, or for example, in the case of the compiler framework, it just doesn't work if you're doing anything other than a pre- or a post-order traversal. So what we do is we've come up with a new dependence analysis and fusion strategy that lets you take general imperative tree traversals and fuse them together automatically. Uh, and this is enabled by two key novelties. One is an integrated code motion pass that basically figures out what order you need to schedule your statements to preserve dependencies. And to expose more opportunities for fusion, a partial fusion optimization that basically says that for some, in some cases, I might not be able to fully fuse two traversals, but there are times when these two traversals are accessing parts of the tree where it's legal to do them at the same time. So we can figure this out. So let me explain to you exactly how these things, kinds of things work. So here's what code motion is. Code motion is actually probably the thing, the immediate thing that you thought of when I showed that broken example which is that if I try to fuse together a post-order traversal and a pre-order traversal, it didn't work. So what I should really do is change the order of the statements so that everything fuses together correctly. In particular, I should take that n.x++ and move it to the beginning of traversal t1 so that they're now both pre-order traversals, and now I can fuse things together without any problem. Right? Uh, and so code motion automatically discovers this schedule uh, and figures out how you can then do fusion. Partial fusion is a little bit trickier, so let me take a second to explain it. Here's a slightly more complicated example. So what we're doing is, again, two uh, traversals of the tree. Uh, traversal T1 updates n.x based on its right child's n.x field. Traversal T2 updates n.y based on n.x and its right child's n.y uh, uh, field. So this is what it means in terms of dependencies. In traversal 1, I have to traverse through the right part of the tree before I can update n.x safely. In traversal 2, uh, sorry, and then I have to, of course, update n.x before I can use it in traversal 2. And then traversal 2 has to perform this update to n.y before it can traverse the right field, which would blow away the correct value of y. So these are the dependencies that we need to preserve. If we try to do fusion, we might get something that looks like this. I'm doing a single traversal, and I've just sort of put together all of the statements. And some things work great. n.y correctly happens before I traverse the right, child, the right field of the tree. Uh, the update to n.x correctly happens after I visit the right part of the tree, so those dependencies are preserved, but I'm now updating n.y before I get a chance to update n.x, and the code is broken. Uh, and in particular, there is no order of these statements that will preserve all of the dependencies in this program. I can't actually fuse these two traversals together. But all hope is not lost. Here's what I can do instead. The dependencies only are really happening because of traversals on the right part of the tree, on the right children of the tree. So what I can do is create a slightly different version of the fused traversal, where when I'm traversing the right part of the tree, when I'm traversing n.right and n.left, I don't execute the fused code. I execute the original unfused code. So, but I still execute the fused code when I'm traversing the left part of the tree. And now all of my dependencies are preserved. Partial fusion actually lets me take advantage of fusion in the situations where it's going to be allowed. Just to give you a visual sense of how this looks, uh, here's what's going to happen. While I'm doing the combined traversal, uh, I will step through both traversals through the left child of the tree, children of the tree. And then on the right side of the tree, the traversals will happen one after another. Right? So I get the benefits of fusion when I can. I preserve the separate traversals when I have to in order to preserve the dependencies. OK, so this is all well and good, but figuring this out in the presence of very complicated things is obviously a, a challenging task. Uh, so to address this problem, we came up with a, a, an approach we call uh, Tree Fuser, which does a couple of things. First, it builds a dependence graph that captures the dependent structures of the traversals. Then it identifies fusion opportunities, in particular partial fusion opportunities and continues identifying more and more fusion opportunities until eventually there's nothing left to be done. You've fused as much as you can, and then we synthesize code. So let me quickly walk you through these steps. Building the dependence graph is going to look familiar if you've looked at any of sort of the uh, dependence analysis for linked data structures work that goes all the way back to the 80s. Right? We're basically going to use access pads to figure out where our dependencies might be. So here's how it works. We build a dependence graph that creates one node for every statement in a traversal and one node for every call in our traversals. So these guys become our dependence graphs. Then 
we analyze individual statements in each traversal. For each statement, we collect an access path, which basically tells us, rooted at a particular node in the tree, what fields are we reading and writing. So for example, the statement in traversal 1 writes to n.x and reads from n.write.x. Similarly, the statement in traversal 2 writes to n.y and reads from n.write.y as well as n.y. And then we can just intersect these access paths together to figure out when two statements might have a dependence. So there's a dependence, as we, kn as we know, from the update uh, of n.x to the update of n.y. Now, if we want to build up access paths for calls, all we're going to do is essentially summarize everything this call can do. We're going to basically do a transitive closure of all the possible things this call can do and use that to define our access paths for calls. So here's what that looks like. Uh, if you imagine executing t1 at n.left, all that's happening is that now our access is not rooted at n, it's rooted at n.left. What we're accessing is n.left.x and n.left.right.x. That's what happens when I invoke t1 on n.left. And I can continue this process uh, transitively and construct what basically is a regular expression that captures the full access path, all the possible reads and writes that t1 might invoke, might perform when it's invoked on n.left. Okay, so now I just have a bunch of regular fronts, which I can intersect, just like I can intersect access paths. And using that, I can build up the dependent structure for my overall program. So now we have a dependence graph. How do we use this to perform fusion? The insight to partial fusion is that fusing traversals shouldn't be thought about as fusing together two different functions. We should think about fusion as fusing together different calls to the same child of the tree. If I can fuse those together, then those two calls will happen at the same time. So what we're going to do here is treat fusion as merging together call sites. So for example, if I merge the two calls to C1, so these are the two calls to the left child from traversals T1 and T2, I get a new dependence graph that looks like this. And as long as this dependence graph is acyclic, everything is fine. I haven't actually broken any dependencies. And the details about why this is true, including some proofs, are in the paper. So what this says is that I can merge together the two calls to n.left, but when I try to merge together the two calls to n.right, so I merge together the two C2 nodes, I get a cycle in the dependence graph. And what this means is that there's no, actually, there's no way to do this without violating some dependencies. So the final fused dependence graph we get looks like this. We were able to fuse the calls to n.left, and we were not able to fuse the calls to n.right. From here, our job is to synthesize some code that will actually implement this fused traversal. Now, I'm not going to show you all of the details of this because it's, it's relatively complicated. The details are in the paper. Uh, but I do want to show you one thing. The first step in synthesizing our fused traversal is we perform a topological sort of this dependence graph. So we get a new, I mean, basically we're just sorting these guys, right? And this is how we implement code motion. By doing this topological sort, we're basically saying these are the statements that need to happen in particular orders. It doesn't matter what original traversal they came from. All that matters is that if they happen in this order, we're going to preserve dependencies. And importantly, because we know the graph is acyclic, we know this is okay. So in particular, if you take that topological sort that we came up with, you can directly match it up to the correctly fused code. Right? Uh, I make the merged call to t12 on n.left, and then I make different calls to, uh, to n.right. Uh, there's, a, there's a bit more of a challenge here about what happens if these tra uh, traversals truncate at different times, if they return early. Uh, there's a lot of details about how we get that right. I would refer, uh, refer you to the paper. So in the last few minutes, I want to uh, answer the following question. Does it work? Can we actually do this? Right? Um, and so there's two questions that I want to answer. One is, can we effectively fuse complex traversals? Can we take complex traversals and fuse them together in a way that actually gives us some fusion benefits? We reduce the number of times we traverse the tree. And then, also importantly, is, okay, great, you revert, re reduce the number of times you've traversed the tree, does it actually speed up your code? So in our evaluation, we looked at three different case studies. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about one of them fairly briefly, which is we wrote a series of six AST traversals that do various kinds of optimizations, constant folding, constant propagation, uh, stuff like that. And we applied TreeFuser to this sequence of optimizations. Um, and first of all, TreeFuser worked. It actually correctly fused everything together. Um, and what we can see is the following. One, partial fusion was necessary. None of those traversals could actually be fused together completely. They all required at least some calls, some parts of their traversals, to be separate from everybody else. Two, uh, once you do the fusion, you can measure sort of the number of dynamic calls, the number of times that you visit different nodes of the tree, and uh, we reduce this to 43% of the, un of the uh, unfused baseline, so a more than 50% reduction in the number of visits you make to the tree. Uh, and if you turn off code motion, so if you don't let statements get reordered, 
then uh, that number is only seven, uh, 30%. So it, it definitely helps to do both partial fusion and total motion. So uh, to evaluate, we tried, we took those AST traversals, the unfused and fused versions, and ran them on different ASTs. Uh, this was a machine with a pretty big cache, so we had to run on pretty big ASTs before we sort of saw, uh, saw the differences. Um, but the takeaways are as follows. Uh, we get about 80% fewer L3 cache misses uh, by performing fusion. We get anywhere between 50 and 70% fewer L2 cache misses. Uh, and in particular, so you can see here on the speed up graph, uh, the x-axis shows how big the tree is and the y-axis shows the speed up. We can get up to a 70% performance improvement uh, from doing fusion. So in conclusion, tree traversals are everywhere. There are lots of applications that are built as sequences of tree traversals. Uh, people know that in order to get good performance out of these applications, you have to do fusion. You have to reduce the number of times you do tree traversals, and people typically do this by hand. But very complicated, especially as those traversals get more and more complex. Um, and it's not always safe to do this. So we implement a tree fuser, an automatic framework, that uses uh, integrated code motion as well as this notion of partial fusion to exploit lots of fusion opportunities and give us significant performance benefits. Uh, and if you're interested, you can download our framework uh, from the link there. The link's also in the paper. Thank you.